the decisions we are making when we're facing complex issues. We will discuss, we will be transparent, we will share our values, and we will have the ultimate goal of you know, asking whether this is the right thing to do. Hello, I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson. Welcome to Ethics in Business in Their Own Words. ACCA, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants, has teamed up with Carnegie Council and CFA Institute to produce this interview series launched in 2018 for Global Ethics Day. The series features global business leaders exploring how businesses are preparing for an ethical future in the face of challenges presented by globalization, technology, and human psychology. Today, we're talking to David Wu, Visiting Research Fellow at the Center for Finance and Development, National Institute of Financial Research, Tsinghua University, Beijing, and Deloitte China Vice Chair, National Financial Service Industry Leader. Deloitte China provides a full range of services, including audit and assurance, financial advisory, risk advisory, and tax services to local, multinational, and growth enterprise clients in China. He's also the first Association of Chartered Certified Accountants member in China. You have some 30 years experience working in professional services uh, in this industry. Obviously, the focus of your work has changed over that time, but, but ethics, the ethical focus of the work you do, has it changed over the years? Um, I would like to explain the two layers of ethics uh, in our profession. The first layer is uh, do the work with good quality, and that's professionalism's foundation. And the second layer is to tell the truth and to share what should be uh, broadcasted or uh, to be transparent in the financial information. So in these two areas, to do work with quality and also to be transparent and have the courage to share whether it's bad news or the truth you know, of the story behind the numbers. This has never changed. And you mentioned transparency. Is transparency the key to being ethical? Um, yes, I think so. Because uh, uh, transparency is uh, giving you know, people a uh, basis of trust so that information was shared in an appropriate way. So those people who make decisions based on the information, they know will have a sound basis to start with. And the transparency is an important part of the efficiency of financial market. What is, what is the biggest ethical challenge for the profession now and in, in the future? Um, I'll take a step back and say the biggest challenge for uh, the profession is actually attracting uh, the brightest people, the right talents, into the profession. But the ethical challenge is obviously training uh, these professionals to have uh, professionalism in uh, their behavior, in their day-to-day -day work. And that is uh, also very challenge in China context because the profession is very young. We only introduced professional accountant from 1988, so about 30 years ago. So we have only trained arguably three generations of accountants and to instill professionalism in everything we do uh, requires uh, a lot of attention, a lot of support, a lot of mentoring, and this, I think, is a challenge. You talk about mentoring. How, how do you, and, and it's a learning process probably for you too, because this is new in this market, as you say. Um, how do you implement the bullet points of ethics when you're teaching the next generation? There are two ways. Of course, one is the textbook, but more important is in real practice. So everything we do, you know, we will share and we will set examples. And for the decisions we're making when we're facing complex issues, we will discuss, we will be transparent, we will share our values, 
and we will have the ultimate goal of you know, asking whether this is the right thing to do. So I think sharing and training in real work is the most important way to develop our talents in ethics. What role does your company play in the community? Um, we are a leading professional services firm. We help our clients to solve their complex and important business problems. And through our work, we also build trust in the society. And all that, we make an impact that matters in the society. How do you build the trust? In my day-to-day -day work as a professional accountant, I have to apply professional standards. I am very conscious of having an independent mindset and I have the courage to uh, share you know, these uh, informations with the right stakeholders. And these are the part and uh, parcel of building trust for the society. How does your company work to create diversity in the industries it serves? Um, the diversity, uh, there are more issues, but fundamentally it comes to the concept of inclusion. We embrace in talents. Uh, my personal challenge to share, as we discussed so openly, is actually to treat women with equal respect and also give equal managerial opportunities or responsibilities to female. Because I came from an environment where my mother was not allowed to eat at the table as the men eat. So my mother and the sisters, they eat in the kitchen. So I grow you know, in a situation that uh, males are the people who make decisions. In my leadership development, I was diagnostic as a little bit you know, lacking of consideration for female talents. And the female talents in professional accounting world are a big part of talents. They work well in the situation, provide uh, good solutions you know, to complex issues. So I was uh, asked to actually attend training courses. And uh, then I realized I'm, you know, uh, I have these shortcomings. So now I have actually particularly becoming a, a, a friend of some female leaders. And each year we have in China, we have a women's uh, festival, uh, the March the 8th, that's the date, uh, International Women's Day. Yes. And on that date, I'm always in some government organized events to stand up and help you know, the, uh, uh, build a stronger leadership with females. So diversity for me in particular is to develop uh, female talent. It's fantastic. I mean, this is, you've come a long way. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> uh, to be very honest, you know, um, I came from a poor uh, family where, uh, or, you know, all the China, they, we don't have tap water. So in the morning, I get up to wash my face. The water is provided to me by my older sister. So every morning, my older sister takes the water to where, you know, I wash my face. So it's actually a long story to come into where I am now to realize and embrace female talents and to develop. It's a challenge for China as well, because uh, uh, if you see the communist uh, government, you know, we're lacking of female leadership talents. So we need to develop that. It's, that's quite an evolution, I have to tell you, because, yeah. Um, so speaking of, uh, on, on this point, how does your company work to support the minorities who are already in the workplace? So in this case, women. Um, we have now policies that encourage us to actually set KPIs that we advance female talents into the leadership uh, uh, you know, positions. 
globally and in China. So at this moment, I think we are doing uh, very well and we identify uh, female talents where we give them more uh, coaching and also by providing more flexible uh, working hours to allow uh, talented you know, female leaders to go uh, pursue what they want uh, in their life and then coming back to work as a professional accountant. How is your company managing your impact on the environment? Um, we manage the impact on the environment in many ways, but I just want to share my personal stories. Uh, the two uh, areas that I focused on is to reduce, one is to reduce uh, artificial lightning uh, in offices and in cities, because there are too many focus on lightening up, but actually over lightening is also not good to environment, more use of electricity and uh, less healthy environment. And if you go to some of the Chinese cities, you know, they over lightening to show it's an advanced city, but it's actually not. So we have teams to assess what is the good lightening level and to reduce lightening in offices, in public space, uh, and that would reduce the use of electricity. Second uh, area that I focused is also the water. Uh, when you see the pollution in air, you saw it, but uh, those are not the worst local pollution problem. The worst local pollution problem is water and the water sinks into the land. So any uh, places that the firm can do you know, to clean up the water is, is an area we apply some resources uh, to help others. So we're going to move a little bit into um, this increasingly automated world that we're living in. Um, how does your company help management, employees, and providers adapt to technological changes? Uh, technological change is the big trend. Uh, in particular, with the introduction of AI, 90% uh, of the traditional accounting work will be replaced by robots. And this is what we're facing. Accountants can be replaced by AI. But the skills to analyze this data, to provide useful information for business owners to make decisions, you know, these skills will not be replaced. So what we are doing now as a company is actually not only giving our talents opportunities to train them uh, to, towards more mastering the uh, analytical skills, but also to share our success with our clients. Let our clients know what will be automated what can be introduced into their system to do their business more efficiently. But in the meantime, they know what is their core competency, what they should focus to develop their people. How is your company helping with the retraining of that management? Um, employees and providers will need to adjust to this automated world. So how do you reprogram people? Um, in Deloitte, we have uh, established a very good network of education grant for our clients and our own people. We have a network of Deloitte University. We have a network of Deloitte digital entities. And of this, we also opened a greenhouse where innovative ideas can be uh, shared and developed. We open these educational grounds free of charge to our clients, introduce the management to coming to our places to go through what's in their mind, and then identify the gap for the companies to be a company of the future. Uh, like ourselves, we're sitting here, but if we go to our Deloitte lab, it's a totally different uh, concept. 
totally different conversation. We will try, try to identify the gaps uh, you and I have for servicing our clients in the future. And this is the framework that we want to share the society. And Deloitte want to be in the forefront of technology development and also have the human touch. And we can never forget about the human touch. And that includes uh, 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 some equality, uh, you know, for, for salary and also uh, how to equip humans with good technology. So these are challenge topics, uh, but I'm confident that we are helping our talents and helping our ta clients to move to the di right direction. How do you convince your employees that as much as we want to embrace AI because it's the future, but AI is not replacing the human touch. How do they not feel that there's a competition between the two? Um, we focused on mentoring a lot. And this mentoring is actually a very personal sharing of knowledge, sharing of goals, and the sharing of motivation uh, among our team. So this cannot be replaced by AI. And we believe this is the strength of a professional service firm. In the future, with the AI coming in, anyone who has a knowledge and also who has a personal touch is a consultant in some way to, you know, to the people. You are my consultant in guiding me to tell my story. And this cannot be uh, replaced by AI. So we hope with this you know, skill set, with this uh, infrastructure, we will engage with our clients more, with our people more. We know that the profession has a global code of conduct, the IFAC code that covers these five areas, integrity, objectivity, professional competence and due care, confidentiality, and professional behavior. Which one matters to you the most in this list? These are part of an integrated framework. All these five are important. But when I became a partner of this firm, I asked my senior partner, what is the most important ethical behavior I need to watch out. And he said, confidentiality. And also, don't take advantage of the information you have. Every day, I will receive phone calls from clients. They may go in to buy another business. They may go in to invest a huge amount you know, in some new technology. Companies get to be merged and separated. In all these activities and the transactions, if I want to profit for myself, I will be able to do that. But that's against my professional standard. So to remain independent as well as to refuse the temptation that's there, it's a very challenge part uh, for the professional accountants. And I think to build efficiency of capital market in this part of the world, we should always focus on integrity and also not to take advantage of the information the insiders have. So you were the first ACCA member in China. Can you tell us a bit about why you chose accounting as a profession? Um, I actually was not that smart to choose a country <laughs> for my future career. The government allocated me to study a country because of my high score in mathematics. So they say that this boy knows mathematics, <laughs> so he should be an accountant. So I 
actually started to learn accounting uh, in a government university. And at the time um, I started learning accounting, I even don't know what's the difference between a calculator and a computer. And at that time, we started to learn Ebex. Um, so later on, of course, when the shopping opened more and more, we have the opportunities of allowing the international accounting firms to operate in China. We introduced the knowledge and the talents from outside China to help us develop. So not only I become the first ACCA member uh, in mainland China, but also the first generation of partners in a big accounting firm. So through that, you know, a generation of professionals uh, started to grow. And then, you know, we work together with the CEOs, with the government officers to make a change in the society. You know, I want to ask you a little bit <clears throat> of your personal um, reaction to so much of this. So you're just telling me that you were basically given the task of being an accountant because you're good in math. Okay, fine. But now this market is opening up. Deng Xiaoping is opening the doors a little, little by little. You've got these businesses coming in. That's a lot of information for somebody to take in who has been basically living in a bubble for the first part, essentially, of your life. How did you digest all of this stuff? This is a very difficult philosophical question. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's great. Let me think about it, how to uh, answer that. Um, I feel I am very fortunate. Opportunities coming to me. So if I work hard, stay on the course, I get opportunities and opportunities. And the result of that is I changed my own life and changed my family's life. It's very rewarding. And on the other hand, I see the differences between China and the outside world. And the uh, responsibility sense comes into uh, my heart, and I want to do a little bit more. And in that direction, I feel if I don't contribute more or give back to the society more, uh, I actually will you know, disappoint those people who don't have opportunities while they see me get the opportunities. So in that motivational direction, I continue to work hard and also you know, making more friends outside China and bring the good practices into China. And also have to, the courage to share that we are a backward country. We have a lot to learn to catch up uh, in many sense. And uh, the efficiencies of our economy uh, is you know, at the low end. The pollutions you, know, you see in many cities, it's a big problem. And also the diversity of workforce and also have opportunities for less uh, you know, uh, advantaged people, who, who those peop to those people uh, who don't have these opportunities. Uh, I feel I'm lucky, but on the other hand, I feel there are more and more responsibilities for me to do a little bit more, to do a little bit better, to help the society to advance. You know, and forgive me, because your story is so fascinating, so I'm, I'm sorry if I'm digressing a little bit, but... Thank you for the chance. Um, you, um, you have been afforded this fantastic opportunity to see so much. Many people would leave the country and go set up somewhere else, but yet you're faced, the more you end up knowing your country, you're seeing all of the challenges, you're saying to yourself it's poor, there are parts that are backwards. Do you ever feel like giving up, or does it give you more drive to do even more? You ask very difficult questions. Sorry. <laughs> so it's, it's your, your, yeah. your story is fascinating. Um, to do more, I think it's a human nature to excel. Uh, this is important uh, in my heart and to motivate me to go to work every day. But more important, I think, 
to do the good thing, to do the right thing, and through those small efforts to see the societies changed, to see the people, you know, you make impact on them, it's very rewarding. I think these are those good things in the nature of the human to really motivate me to advance. I read uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, you know, uh, biography and all those books. I think they, they are very motivational. They are good people 100 years ago to already set up the foundation to help people to do the right thing. And we wouldn't uh, you know, have this dialogue if we don't have the Carnegie Foundation give uh, you know, us this opportunity. We can arguably, we can say 104 years ago that Carnegie set up this foundation for us to you know, have this dialogue. I think we should uh, leave a legacy uh, for the next generation doing the right thing. Ethics also mean intergenerational uh, equity, intergenerational justice. You know, we should do the right things, not only for ourselves, but also for the next generation.